was just asking uh, Brittany if she wouldn't mind muting everybody so we could get started. And then um, I was just saying, I apologize if I'm in the shadows, but I've been told I had a face for radio. That's why that was in my past life career. But I also refuse to be inside in a basement on a beautiful day like this. We're celebrating those that are completing their degrees and our graduates that are being acknowledged. So I hope to have a little bit of nature while we uh, celebrate those students that are being uh, presented today. If the ambient noise is too much, let me know. I'll go back inside and into my little dungeon of an area into the dark lights. But with that being said, um, at some point, I believe Brittany's going to share the uh, program with you with some regards to the order in which we are acknowledging and recognizing our students and who will be speaking and presenting in that regard. I'll just say a brief something before we get started with our um, presentation of recipients. And that is, this is basically one of the best times of the year. I love it. I've heard from a number of my colleagues how they love this time of the, the year to see students completing their degrees and achievements they've made, not only their degrees, but sometimes in their personal lives, or overcoming things or things that they never even thought about doing while they were pursuing their undergraduate or graduate degrees, let alone the opportunity to interact with and engage with the families and the friends that some of us have heard so much about, maybe spoken to on the phone or had some sort of email communication. And right now, I am so mad in some ways. I tell people all the time, this situation and circumstance just sticks me off in a number of ways. But one of them is I do not get to interact with the students in the face-to-face -face environment in our classrooms. I don't get to engage with my colleagues crossing paths on a regular basis just to see how folks are doing and hear about the things that are going on in their personal and professional lives. And this is one of those moments where I'm a little bit mad, but we're gonna try and turn that around or like I'll try and turn it around and definitely be joyous about celebrating those of you that are being acknowledged today and definitely happy for those of you that are completing this part of your life and moving on to whatever the next phase and era may be for you. So with that being said, I'd like to shut up, mute myself and open the microphone for Dr. Nicotera to introduce our first, our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Craig. I echo everything that you have said. And um, thankfully, unlike our uh, forebears 100 years ago who went through this, we have the internet. So uh, we still get to see each other, at least in little tiny postage stamps on my screen. It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Lakeisha Anderson, who is the recipient of the 2020 Graduate Alumni Award. I have some words to say which I'm sure come as no surprise uh, to anybody. Uh, Dr. Anderson actually received the first PhD in communication from George Mason University in 2010. So it's very fitting that she's receiving this award on the 10th anniversary of her graduation. Uh, the work that she began on mothering and mental health while she was a student has continued to be a top priority for her. She participates in community speaking events and podcasts. She's written both refereed and invited publications on the topic. She's consulted with boards on issues around motherhood and mental health, specifically postpartum mood, postpartum mood disorders. She also manages a support group for women suffering from these disorders for several and has done so for several years. And through this work, she has both an impact on those suffering and also helps their loved ones better understand these issues. So she really is putting into practice the translational nature of our culture in our doctoral program at Mason. She's also an accomplished administrator. She tells me that she's, quote, passionate about good administrative work, unquote. Lakeisha, I think there's a support group for that somewhere. We can find that for you. I need it too. At Indiana State University, very early in her career, she served in several important administrative roles, working with deans and provosts, advocating for faculty and students. And that's something that has marked her career ever since. Her ability to listen, to communicate well, and to think critically about various sides of an issue lend themselves very well to this work. She's also worked in an administrative role at Johns Hopkins University. As you all may know, Lakeisha is currently the Director of Academic and Professional Affairs at the National Communication Association, where, among other numerous things, she creates public programs that serve to bridge the divide between communities and academic scholars. And so again, she puts our ethic of translation to work in a very, very real way that serves us all as academics in the discipline. Each year, she and her team identify a topic 
and organize public programs that bring in people from the academic community to talk to community members about the role of communication in addressing that topic. Last year, they focused on environmental communication, the role of communication in climate change, attitude and behaviors, the role of rhetoric in energy conversations. Uh, before that, they focused on science communication and miscommunication, health in rural and minority populations, and this year they're focused on politics. These programs serve as a way to make communication and communication scholarship relevant to people outside academia. Help them better understand how our attitudes, values, beliefs, and behaviors are shaped by various forms of communication and communicators. She continues to engage in classroom teaching and in mentorship. In 2017, she won an Outstanding Faculty Award uh, of the Year, Outstanding Faculty of the Year Award at Johns Hopkins. In addition to teaching in our discipline, she has taught in genomics and public health. She communicates well about complex ideas, holds students accountable while still being compassionate, and makes academia more accessible and less scary for students. At NCA, she takes pride in the ways that her work includes voices that we may not otherwise hear hear from. Often, when we seek expert advice, we hear it from what Lakeisha calls the usual suspects, the people with the loudest voices or the most research funding, sometimes both. However, there's a lot of great research being done by faculty in small teaching colleges and in institutions that are less research active. There are a lot of faculty in these institutions who also have excellent advice for teaching. And so, although we often think of being inclusive in terms of race and gender, and those things are important, Lakeisha believes that geographic inclusion and methodological inclusion are also very important. And the more we highlight the work of people from these smaller institutions and on smaller platforms, the greater access we have to ideas and knowledge. And so she's also putting into practice our ethic in the department for um, demarginalizing marginalized voices beyond the traditional um, um, explanation of marginalization. So I'm very proud to present to you my former student and our graduate alumna of the year, Dr. Lakeisha Anderson. Yeah, can you? I'm getting feedback. Does anybody else hear that? Good. <clears throat> All right, so thank you, Anne, for that introduction. Wait, wait, Linda, can you mute, please? Sorry. Okay, that's better. I can hear now. Great, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. They told me I have about 10 minutes to speak to you today, and I know it feels a little odd doing this behind a computer screen and that we would all prefer to be together to celebrate today. But hopefully this won't be too bad. I think that... Um, there's a great group of people here together, so I'm excited to talk to you. So I wanted to talk to you today about two specific ships. The first is friendship and the second is mentorship. Both are important during your educational journey, but become even more important as you enter the workforce and find yourself navigating new cities, new relationships, new critiques of your work, and the mixture of emotions that come with all those life changes. Several of my longest lasting friendships happened because I came to Mason. The same can be said for a couple of people I consider mentors. So I want to look at those experiences and explore how those relationships have helped me along my path since I graduated 10 years ago. So let me start with friendship. I don't know that any of us are looking for friendship when we begin our work at a university. It's usually not what we're thinking about when we apply for a graduate program. But if we're lucky, we make lifelong relationships while we're there. The friendships we form help make the journey more tolerable on the days you want to give up. They help us through our least favorite classes. They help build you up when your confidence is low and they celebrate you when you achieve something great. These friendships grow with you, shifting and shaping as your lives change. There's something comforting about having those people in your life. They've seen you at your best and at your worst. They've seen you before you achieve success. And there are so many wonderful people I met through my time at Mason, but there are three that I consider amongst my greatest friends and, and confidence. The first is Don Boylo. Don was the first person I met in this department back when he was the outgoing chair in 2004. And Don is a gem of a person, as I'm sure you all know. The first pieces of mail I received at both my previous job at Indiana State and my current job at NCA were from Don. 
The first was about how to move on after the dissertation, which was relevant to a new assistant professor who had just moved halfway across the country and definitely needed some inspiration and motivation. The second was an article about NCA from when he worked there. Both made me feel more at ease during a big life change. His friendship has meant the world to me. He has helped me make hard decisions with his good advice and his ability to empathize with any situation. He makes me laugh and remember not to take things too seriously. He's everything you want in a friend and a little bit more. When I first came to Mason, years before I began my PhD program, I worked as an adjunct. In the fall of 2004, I was very pregnant and had no time for college students acting a fool, which is exactly what I thought about Maria Carabelli the first time I laid eyes on her. I wasn't all that nice to her, and I think she actively campaigned against me being hired full time six months later. But thankfully, her campaign failed because we quickly discovered that there were, we're more alike than not. We worked together for five years, but she's been one of my best friends for 15. In that time, we've gone through the loss of both our moms, celebrated graduations, weddings, and new babies, gone through a rather nasty divorce for me, taken a lot of trips, and made a lot of fun but poor choices, often involving chocolate cake. Maria is my person. She helped me look for houses when I took a position in Indiana, she was the loudest person at my PhD graduation. She was there to tell me that reviewer two is an awful human the first time I received a journal rejection. She refused then and refuses now to let me get down on myself. Gaining her as a friend is one of the best things to come from my person. And with that, I'm pretty sure I could wrap this up and she would be fine, but I'll go on. There are numerous other people that I've met along the way. People I once sat in class with or people I now have dinner with or send memes to or call when I need a speaker for a convention. Some of these people sat in class with me for a, for a semester and some sat in there with me for years. Some I published with, some I speak to once a year and catch up, but they all mean something to me. We all share a common understanding of what it meant to be a graduate student at a specific time in this program. We all share a common bond in that we survived those three or four years together. And we all represent the same degree, the same university, the same program. If you look at your classmates, you're looking at a lifelong support network. These are the people who get it. They're in the trenches with you. They're the people you can count on today and who you'll always have a connection to. Some will be your lifelong friends. For me, that classmate and lifelong friend is Christy Ledford. There are only three people in my PhD cohort and all three of us were friends. But Christy is one of my favorite people. She's one of my favorite people to work with to laugh with, to eat dinner with. We've sat at a restaurant in San Francisco and wrote all over a tablecloth about research ideas. Thankfully, it was a paper tablecloth that we took with us. We've complained together about not being taken seriously when trying to explain health communication to health professionals. We've published together multiple times, which is always fun, but not only because we're friends, but because we share a common background and we understand what the other knows and can do. While she is my cohort sister, she feels more like my big sister. She's been a wonderful friend and colleague, and I'm thankful that Mason brought us together, and even more thankful that we sat in all those classes together. It led to some really meaningful work that continues today. I hope you're all lucky enough to have your own Dawn or Maria or Christy. Having those people make all the difference, not just in your educational journey, but in your life's journey. There are others who you meet along the way who may be your friends, but also serve another vital role in your life, and these are your mentors. Mentorship is very important to me, and it's something I spend a lot of time thinking about. I often think about how I can be a better mentor to my graduate students, how to continue to guide my former students, and how to identify the mentoring gaps in our discipline. It's widely accepted in higher education that mentoring is lacking for PhD students. So I'm constantly thinking of new ways to create mentoring programs for graduate students through my work at NCA. It's very important to have strong mentors, and it's important to foster and nurture those relationships not because you may need your mentor to one day write you a recommendation letter, though that may also be the case, but because these are the people whose work and guidance will help you be a better professional, a better teacher, a better scholar, and a better mentor to your students or staff or younger colleagues. I am blessed with an abundance of role models, really strong female mentors in particular. Two from Mason are always in my head when I'm working or thinking about how to approach a difficult topic. And these two women are Anne Nicotera and Kathy Rowan. Anne was my dissertation advisor, and everyone told me you marry your dissertation advisor so you better like her. 
And while I don't feel married to Anne, it's true that you always have a connection to your advisor. This is most exemplified in a story about a time where she really made me mad. I finished what I thought was an excellent first chapter of my dissertation. She told me it would be shorter than the other chapters would be, so I turned in something like 24 pages for my introduction chapter. She read it, and then she said, this isn't enough, go do more work. And I did not appreciate that. Clearly, I thought I'd done enough or I wouldn't have submitted it. I guess I expected a page number, much like my students expect now. I think we went two days without speaking after that. But shockingly, I did find more to write and it did improve my introduction and in turn my literature review, which better informed my analysis because she knew what she was doing. So three years ago, I had a really spectacular graduate student working on a phenomenology for her master's thesis. She submitted her first section draft and I heard myself say to her, this isn't quite enough. You really need to focus on the introduction and think about adding some literature on X or Y. And then I laughed and said to her, I know you're mad at me right now, but I promise this will pay off. And it did. She wrote a stellar thesis that looked at breast cancer and social support that led to three convention papers and helped her land a new job. While Anne may have been tough at times, she taught me a few things. She taught me about being a compassionate mentor, about knowing how to applaud someone's work while also encourage them to do more and better. She taught me something I'm not even sure she realizes, and that's to focus on what matters. I sometimes think to myself, what would Anne think of this nonsense? And I can almost hear her say, doesn't matter, just focus on you. That's really important as you move into a new chapter of your life post-graduation. It's easy to get wrapped up in office politics or the machine that is promotion and tenure. So I think remembering to focus on what is good for us and learning to, to reduce the noise is a good lesson for all of us. And that brings me to Kathy. Over the course of the past 16 years, Kathy has seen me in ways few others have. She's seen me scared, she's seen me cry, she's seen me doubt myself, and she's seen me grow into a confident scholar and teacher, encouraging me at every step. Kathy is a natural problem solver. Bring her your concern and she'll try to fix it. As some of you heard me say when at her retirement ceremony earlier this year, when Carl didn't like my quantitative GRE scores, Kathy told me how to gain his respect. When I disclosed to her that I was dealing with postpartum depression and shared a really terrible experience with healthcare system that wasn't quite ready to address postpartum mood disorders, she helped me turn my anger and sadness and confusion and doubt into a productive, cathartic risk message. She asked me what puzzled me and what confused me, and those that line of questioning lit my path. Her questions and her guidance allowed me to write some of my most meaningful work about postpartum health and risk communication. Kathy teaches me to this day how to be a kinder, smarter, more thoughtful person. She's a mentor in ever since the word and her scholarship and her teaching of others greatly influences my scholarship, teaching and mentoring. Nothing I planned is really how life happened for me. Like Anne said, I led my faculty council in the third year as an assistant professor. And while that was really ridiculous on, the, on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences to vote, it helped me realize that I do really love administration and that I'm really good at it. So as my department started to fall apart, I chose to walk away from a tenure track job despite being ready for early tenure. And instead of taking another tenure track position, I accepted my job with NCA to build on administrative experience. Kept up with my research program and I teach anywhere between five and eight graduate classes, which is something that will really make you appreciate undergraduates. I know that one day I'll go back to the university full time, but I've learned what it is I really like to do. We need administrators who really care about students and advocate for faculty, and I hope I can bring that to the table. But that's not what I thought I would say 10 years ago. So we're all a work in progress, figuring out what it is we're good at, what we like and don't like, and what kinds of teachers and scholars and professionals we want to be. Don't be afraid to figure out your life at your own pace. Don't be afraid to take the road less traveled just because it's less traveled. Don't let anyone tell you what is best for your path because there's so many ways to measure success. Listen to the people you know, your Dons, your Maria's, Christie's, Ann's, and Kathy's. Those people will have your back and having them in your corner will make all the difference. So take a mental picture of these people. Remember them when you land your first job. Make time for them at conventions. Visit them. Send them cards. Think about how you can incorporate their lessons into your own work. There's nothing better than true friendship and valuable mentorship. And luckily, so much of what makes friendship and mentorship work is excellent communication. 
And that's something we should all know how to do. So keep growing, keep learning, and remember to turn around and help the next person in line. Thank you. Thank you, Lakeisha. Everybody hold your applause for one moment. What Brittany's gonna do is she's gonna show us the award because um, obviously we can hand them to people and then she'll unmute everybody so we can applaud uh, and then she'll mute us all again. So and I was like, you don't sound like you're a presidential candidate. Brittany, you're gonna show us a number of things I forget at this point that <laughs> kind of turn me off of her. There she is, yay! Hey, congratulations. <clears throat> Thank you. Should I just continue? Yes. Now you just have to unmute yourself again, Anne. Lakeisha, that's some of the best advice that I have heard given to people um, in a graduate program. Thank you so much um, for all that. I was a little worried about what that story was going to be, but it's not the worst story that one of my former advisees has ever told. But do you remember that experience? I do. Oh, good. Because you made me really mad. <laughs> I, know. I know. I wondered how long it would be before you spoke to me again. But you see, you did. You did. But, you know, there's other stories out there, but I will keep those people away from you at conferences. <laughs> so I'll just go ahead with the next uh, item on the program. Uh, the next item is the um, Lieutenant Colonel William Schrader Award for Excellence in Strategic Communication. The recipient is J.R. Wendler. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Bill Schrader and about the, uh, the meaning of the award and then a little bit about, about John Ross. Um, Bill Schrader graduated from our MA program as an Air Force Fellow in December 2011. Lieutenant Colonel Schroeder served as a Strategic Communication Fellow at the Pentagon from January 2012 to May 2013, after he left us, then as Commander of the 10th Combat Weather Squadron at Herbert, Herbert Field in Florida from June 2013 to May 2014. Bill was a meteorologist um, by profession before he was a uh, Strategic Communicator. His final assignment was as commander of the 342nd Training Squadron at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland, Texas from June 2014 until he was killed on active duty on April 8, 2016. He was fatally wounded during a struggle with a gunman. Schroeder, Schroeder placed himself between the armed individual and the squadron first sergeant, saving others with his selfless action. Lieutenant Colonel Schrader was posthumously honored the Airman's Medal. He was buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Bill's memory has been honored with the Portraits and Courage Posthumous Award in 2017, as well as other, as well as other memorials um, within the Air Force. But who was Bill to us in the Communication Department at Mason? For us, above all, Bill was a skilled professional communicator. So our top priority in preserving Bill's memory was to honor his skill at explaining technical concepts in lay terms clearly without losing crucial components of that complexity, without watering it down. Bill's ability to foster sophisticated understanding in a listener was really quite impressive. He did this with grace and diplomacy. There's actually a video of a class presentation he did um, in Kathy Rowan's class on our department YouTube page uh, where you can see him fielding a question from an audience member um, with great clarity. And in this video, you can see him immediately adjust from where he was talking to the level of understanding of the questioner. So he was able to bring it right down to the level of understanding of the questioner to provide a concise and comprehensible explanation of a very complex meteorological concept that he was explaining. And he did this with grace uh, without embarrassing the questioner at all. Uh, it's really quite something to see as a professional communicator to see how, how quickly and easily he was able to make that, that shift in his demeanor. In the time that's elapsed um, since we first started giving this award in 2017, the importance of clear informative communication has increased exponentially as we are now in an age of misinformation and disinformation. So I also want to give a little shout out to Kathy Rowan um, for being one of the chief designers of this award and in designing the award, uh, the criteria for selecting the award. 
The Schrader Award is presented to a member of the current Air Force Fellows cohort who best demonstrates this skill that was exemplified by Bill Schrader. Our evidence for um, the nominations is found in our classrooms. While it's typical for students to speak in class and engage with the material, this year's recipient, John Ross Wendler, who you all know goes by JR, has the ability to crystallize an explanation quickly, succinctly, and clearly. Uh, and I had the pleasure of, um, of teaching Come 600 last fall. And in that class, I watched on several occasions where a fellow student was almost there on understanding a complex uh, concept. And a comment or two from JR just pushed them right over that ridge. Um, and, and so I think the way that I would summarize it is that JR prioritizes understanding in the room. If he's in the room and we're talking about something that's conceptual, his top priority is the level of understanding in that room. And, and that's um, you know, part of the reason that we selected JR for this award. So for consistent display of excellent in crafting clear, concise explanations of complex issues and concepts, the 2020 Lieutenant Colonel William Schrader Award is presented to J.R. Wendler. So we'll unmute for applause. Still muted. I wasn't muted for that whole thing. Nope, you're good. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. And so now I will turn it over to um, Chris, I believe. Can you hear me now? Yep, you're all good, Chris. Okay. Uh, this this is the Witty Award, right, uh, Brittany? Uh, this is to Gina. Yes. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Um, I echo with what Richard and Anne and others have said about wishing to be with all of you in person today. But uh, that in no way diminishes how excited I am to be here virtually to present the first of two awards I'll be presenting today. Uh, the first is the Joe Witte Award for Excellence in Science Communication, uh, given this year to Gina Fiorelli. I'll tell you a little bit about, about a little bit about the Witte Award. It's named obviously in honor of Joe Witte. For those of you who know him. Uh, he graduated with his master's in science communication about five years ago, and it honors uh, excellence in the scholarly pursuit and study of science communication research, as well as practice. And Joe worked with the Center for Climate Change Communication 4C during his time here uh, to improve the communication of climate change, especially using TV weathercasters as climate communicators. Joe himself, before coming to us, uh, have, having been a, uh, a well-known um, weathercaster in the area uh, for more than uh, three decades. The recipient this year is very deserving. It is Gina Fiorelli. She spent the last semester doing an internship for her master's here at Mason, working with 4C, in particular 4C's Medical Society Consortium on Climate Change. Their goal is to research and communicate the public health impacts of climate change as well as emphasize that climate solutions are ultimately public health solutions in that ways in that ways to communicate climate change could also improve improve public health and well-being she's been a valuable team member i have not worked, worked with her directly but i know people who have and every person i've spoken with said she's been a wonderful person to get to know professionally and personally and has done a great job contributing to the mission of the medical society consortium uh, this past semester, and her, inter her internship just wrapped up. And on a personal level, uh, having worked with her, she's been uh, absolutely wonderful. She's bright, um, and she's extremely uh, motivated. So, Gina, my heartfelt congratulations. A virtual handshake. You are this year's recipient of the Witte Award, and I could not think of a more deserving person. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> Clark. Others will be muted, but I'm clapping for your virtual handshake. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. All right. Um, I think I'm up next. Is that right? All right. Um, this year's Outstanding MA Student Award goes to Brianna Stewart. 
Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about this award. This award is intended for a master's student who has really gone above and beyond um, in the classroom and in the program. And I can't think of someone who's more deserving. Um, I first met Brianna when she came to Mason 10 years ago, and she had just decided that a career in finance was not the career for her. So she decided to join her master's program, and as we talked, uh, it quickly became evident that she was in the right place where she was going to blossom and grow, and I think we've all seen that um, since you've been here, Brianna. And not only has she been an outstanding student, um, so much so that um, I've often had other faculty um, both in our department and others comment that they thought you were a PhD student, not a master's student, um, but you've also done a fantastic job in the classroom as a teacher. Um, but above and beyond that, as if that weren't enough, um, you've also helped us to build the communication center along with Andy Walter, who I also see here. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Brianna has um, worked to think about how we can build the center and has turned it into something that is an amazing support for our students. Um, in less than a week, we were able to turn it into a completely online um, support during this uh, incredibly unexpected semester and also helped to write the NEH grant that wasn't successful, but that helped us to get the um, attention and to do the promotion that we needed to on campus to be able to build what will soon be the Laboratory for Scholarly and Civic Communication. Um, and so she's really gone above and beyond, not just um, being an outstanding student in our program, um, but also making a permanent mark on the institution um, that will be here for a very, very long time. Um, Brianna, your work in the classroom and as a teacher have been outstanding and are enough to be deserving, but you've gone so far above and beyond. And I am so proud that you're going to be joining our PhD program next year and so happy that you've decided to stay. Um, so it is with greatest pleasure that I present you with the Outstanding MA Student Award. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you all so much. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to returning in the fall. Excellent. Um, next up, we have this year's Graduate Teaching Award, and this award goes to Lane Schweiger. Um, the Outstanding Graduate Student Teaching Award, I just added a bunch of words to that title. Um, the Graduate Teaching Award goes to somebody who has really gone above and beyond in the classroom and had a really clear impact on students. Uh, Lane, did a right, Lane arrived at Mason with some outstanding teaching skills, um, thanks to her work at Cal State LA before coming to Mason, and she has just continued to grow. And if you've ever had the pleasure of watching her teacher do a presentation, you know that she's not a forgettable teacher, and that that's a memorable experience. Um, Lane brings so much energy and enthusiasm and passion to her classes, and really cares about her students, and it's clear that they love her too. Um, I want to read um, a comment that one of the students um, also put on Facebook. Um, many of you probably saw this shout out. Um, it, it, Lane's been teaching not just in the basic course, but other courses as well. And um, she had a shout out in COM 350, her mass media and public policy class. And a student said this, um, this was easily one of my favorite classes in my time at Mason. Being an election year, the material was already relevant, but then we watched a public health emergency take precedent in the news cycle and shape policy making decisions. So it was almost as if the world handed us a case study to examine for the rest of the semester. Professor Schweiger went above and beyond in her efforts to help this semester. And she should know that her care and compassion for students and their success is so appreciated. She was invaluable to me during my last few weeks of undergrad and I am so thankful for her. Um, Lane, teaching is the core mission of our institution and that's even more important than ever right now during this difficult semester. And I could not be more proud of the work that you do with our students to help keep them engaged, to help them fall in love with communication, and to help them see the potential in themselves to make the world better. Um, so I'm so pleased to present you with this year's Graduate Teaching Award. Thank you, everybody. Um, you know, I'm, only, I'm only becoming a good teacher because I have incredible teachers, so thank you all you know, mentorship and feedback that you've also given me to improve my skills over the You're excellent. Yay. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa, that was lovely. All right, I think I may be up next. We're we giving the Department of Leadership Award now. Is that correct? That is correct, Gary. All right, so it is my great honor and pleasure to offer the Department of Leadership Award to one of my uh, doctoral student advisees, um, Adebanke Adebayo. 
um, Adabanke had, um, is a, a totally energized, uh, very committed, uh, highly involved individual who really cares about her work and engages others within the department to work with her. She's always eager to start research teams. Uh, she works collaboratively. She's been very active in the Student Government Association. And um, she's just got this infectious personality. Her enthusiasm just kind of wraps everybody up. And, uh, and I think she's the perfect person to receive the Leadership Award. And I'm so happy for you, Adabanke. Congratulations. Thank you all so very much. I really do appreciate it. And I'm grateful for everyone here, and especially my cohort. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, hi, I believe that. Hello? I think Professor Maybach's supposed to give you the award. No, the, this Andy and I are presenting. Is, is my audio off? No, you're good. Okay. Um, Andy and I, as as CGSA, are going to be presenting the um, faculty mentorship awards. Um, so we wanted to say first what they are because they haven't been given in the recent past. So this award recognizes the faculty in the department who have gone above and beyond in their efforts to help our graduate students succeed. CGSA asked our members to nominate the faculty who have provided exceptional academic assistance, taken a special interest in helping meet research or teaching goals, or given them the kind of academic mentorship that is often the key between a student's failure or long-term success in the program. So to the faculty that we honor with this award, we want you to know that your work with us is appreciated and that the impact of your generosity of time and support ripples out from the individual throughout the departmental community. And for that, we want to thank you. So the first award is the MA Faculty Mentorship Award, and this goes to Dr. Sarah Mathis. So since coming to GMU, Sarah has been an integral part of the teaching experiences of every GTA and GL in the department. But her constant support and guidance has been particularly essential for those tackling the often daunting task of teaching for the very first time. Sarah has been there not only to help the teacher navigate na not only to help the teacher navigate classroom pitfalls and instruction strategies, but to check in on the human, to build confidence, provide a listening ear, or simply be sincerely interested in the answer to how are you doing. Not only that. Sarah has gone above and beyond for students to support them academically, acting as second reader on MA projects and encouraging self-advocacy in pursuing career and funding goals. Sarah, CGSA is proud to honor you with the MA Faculty Mentorship Award. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I can only do this because I've had great mentors and it's a pleasure and I'm really honored. I, yeah, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Okay, great. All right. So the PhD Faculty Mentor of the Year Award is uh, the award we're going to be giving out. So this one goes to Dr. Zhao Tang Zhao. Uh, Dr. Zhao has offered support, encouragement, and guidance to the doctoral student through what I'm sure all of us would agree is a very stressful but rewarding time. While serving as the PhD program director, Zhao Chan has helped us navigate the job market, ensured we had ample research opportunities, and served as a professional reference for many of us, myself included. In addition to his program director duties, he's been a mentor and advocate for the doctoral students and is always available to discuss how the program is working for us to ensure we leave Mason with the skills necessary for us to thrive. Each nomination letter for Zhao Tron mentioned how thankful the students were to have a mentor who provided the kind of feedback that pushes us to be better scholars. And Zhao Tron has uh, personally made a big difference in um, my own development here and Jotron, from all of us, we want to thank you for serving as the PhD program director and congratulations on earning the PhD faculty mentorship award. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sandy. I'm very uh, grateful and honored for this award. Um, it has been a pleasure to serve our uh, excellent PhD student. Thank you very much. Yes. I'll take that as a yes. Um, so Andy just said that uh, doctoral program is a stressful or reward, rewarding experience. I think that's a uh, the stressful part is an understatement. At the top of the hour, I was joking that Bob Lichter was going to be on the next season of Survivor. I sort of think of a PhD program as more like being surviving uh, that kind of a trauma. Um, it is not the kind of experience that naturally brings out the nurturer in people. I'm not one that believes that only females are nurturers. I think we have uh, plenty of male nurturers in our department, but I have to say um, my student, my, my dear friend Shailen Patzer is, is like an uber nurturer. The harder she, I can tell you, we threw her into the deep end of the pool on day one. Um, She's been there ever since. She's she's surviving. She's learning to, to swim. She's thriving um, personally. So her own experience, I hope, has been rewarding. I know it has been stressful, but she has never broken stride helping all of us, her fellow students, the faculty, um, the local. Come in uh, every uh, several summers in a row under her uh, mentorship in National Park Service climate communication interns. Um, in all of those instances, uh, Shailen has been there for people. Her first instinct is to ask them what they need, to be attentive to their needs. Um, the fact that she has uh, chaired the, the graduate student, Communication Graduate Student Association for a number of years in a row, um, been in our faculty meetings with us, heard how <laughs> heard what the stress and the trauma looks like on our end of the equation um, and again has comported herself so generously so in, in such a lovely nurturing way throughout. Um, it really was a no brainer this year when we came to decide who who has demonstrated total commitment to the graduate program and, and that would be my, my dear friend Shailen Patzer. So without further ado, I would ask you to give Shailen a round of applause. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, everybody. I think the next award is the Wendy Balazic Communication and Social Change Award. And um, Wendy Balasik was one of my uh, master students when I taught 600 several years ago. She was a very outspoken individual. She was very committed to um, environmental preservation, um, equity for people from a variety of different perspectives, a champion for the underdog. Uh, she was not only an engaged scholar, but she was a very strong advocate and activist. Uh, we were all really shocked and surprised when she was diagnosed unexpectedly of uh, well, stage four lung cancer. Even though she was never a smoker, she was a, a health advocate. Um, it, was a, it was a surprise, and, but she dealt with it with um, a great uh, equanimity and um, continued to inspire everybody. And when she passed away, uh, along with several others, I establish this award in her name to not only honor Wendy, but also honor other graduate students who are engaged scholars addressing important social issues and are trying to make a difference in the world. Uh, that's why I'm really glad that Christian Sider has been identified as a person to receive that award. And I'm going to turn it over to my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Clark, to talk more about Christian. Thanks, Gary. So I have my, my mic on, my apologies. Um, I just want to say, when I think of Christian, uh, I think of the confluence of, of the person and the place. I, I think whether you're a student or a faculty member, whatever job you're in, it's a certain amount of risk involved in taking a position, uh, especially in starting a PhD program. I remember that when I started at Cornell 15 years ago. And when I met Christian, when he visited, uh, it, so, it just so happened that 
it was I, I, it was an odd time of the year, so I was the only person who could make it. And we decided that instead of going to a restaurant, uh, we take him to my house, and my wife was making chili. And we sat down with him, and we got a chance to talk. And it became clear to me that um, this person found the right place with Mason. He was enthusiastic about what he wanted to do, knew exactly who he wanted to work with, and he was just so enthusiastic. And in turn, um, we have benefited from that enthusiasm, uh, that reality, and it's been a pleasure working with him on the Ellen Alda project. And Christian, my congratulations, and I'm glad you found your place here, uh, here at Mason for your PhD studies. Congratulations, Thank you very much. Um, I was very blessed to find a master's program where I found a family, and I was wondering, oh man, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to find that again in the doctoral program. I can find something that I love to study, but I don't know if I'll find the people that I love again. And I, I'm pleasantly surprised uh, that I was I was very wrong about that when I found Mason. Um, you know, everyone here has just been so wonderful, and, and Chris, I've got very fond memories of that night, too. I just want to say briefly, as someone who studies um, end-of-life communication, I'm interested in the concept of symbolic immortality, and I think it's it's really meaningful to me to receive an award named after after Wendy, and I'm grateful to to everyone who helped set up this award and, um, you know, this little piece of symbolic immortality that, that Wendy has achieved through um, through y'all's efforts, um, I, I hope that uh, you know that that's that's something that I'll carry with me. So thank you, thank you very much for this award. All right, I believe it's my turn to present uh, and uh, award one of our MA students with the Departmental Challenge Award. Um, as the MA director, I get the opportunity to interact with so many of our bright minds at that master level and see some minds that are really geared and prepped to go on to PhDs or further opportunities <clears throat> and see how they get to develop. And this young lady, I remember when a colleague, Mark Hobson, I think emailed him, emailed me. He might have stopped by the office, but just gave me a heads up. Should be receiving an application from a young lady by the name of Erica. So I said, okay, I'll keep my eye, make sure the application comes through and she's in here. And I remember the guy got the application. I sent Mark a quick little email, like, yep, I've seen her name. She's good. I think we've got all our materials. I did not get a chance to interact and meet Erica personally until this semester while she was enrolled in COM 725 qualitative methods with me. And I've actually had a conversation with her a couple of weeks ago, just kind of thinking about some opportunities and things she's looking to do beyond the MA program. And this young woman is, this is when you get to meet students that are talented and they don't realize they're talented, how talented they are. I remember reading her application materials and thinking, man, she's already a few steps ahead of some PhD students that I've seen, you know, apply to different programs or gone over their materials. The research that she's done and the motivation for doing the research and the way she's put in effort and then to see that actually, and I just read the student's final papers about a week, week and a half ago, and to see her paper was like, oh yeah, she's she's got that knack. And if she really wants to see that through, she has more than the talent to do that. So it is really an honor and a privilege to be able to present this award to a young lady that I hope understands how talented she is and is able to foster that as she continues to go on. Um, this this uh, departmental challenge goes to Miss Erica Harrington. To me, so I don't know why I turned orange. I don't know if you all can see me, but I, I, for some reason, my camera turned me orange. My lighting hasn't yeah. changed. You're showing orange, actually. You know, <laughs> Justin is wearing a tie. I noticed that Tim Gibson is wearing his tie. <laughs> so uh, y'all look great, and uh, for some reason, I'm bathed in this orange filter. I'm not sure what's going on with my lighting. Um, I am really pleased uh, to be able to introduce uh, the student who is uh, receiving the Communication uh, Graduate Challenge Award um, for uh, the doctoral students. Um, similar to Richard's um, description of Erica, you know, I got this, I got uh, a notification, I think it was from Melissa saying, keep your eye out for the student who's coming in, um, could have been Jatron, keep an eye out for the student who's coming in. 
Um, this is a person who, you know, is going to be a TA and, and oh, by the way, she's having a baby in August. <laughs> so she's having a baby in August and she's going to be a TA. I thought, how is this going to work? Uh, but it worked indeed quite well. Um, uh, Rochelle Mahande is the Communication Challenge Award uh, winner for the uh, doctoral program. Um, and Rochelle really embodies the spirit of this award. Um, the challenge award is both academic challenge, excelling with academic challenge, but also excelling academically um, while dealing with non-academic challenges. And Rochelle really embodies that spirit in both senses of the word. She takes on academically challenging work with success, and she does so while overcoming non-academic challenges. Her work in women's health is centered in an intersectional, critical culturist feminist perspective that's informed by her many years in the field in Africa. Her work toward revolutionizing our approaches to healthcare by centering marginalized voices is well-grounded both practically and theoretically. At the same time, Rochelle's work is susceptible to politicization, and yet she's undaunted in her pursuit of that work. Her focus is clear and unimpeded by the chaotic conversations going on in our field. She stands to be one of the young scholars who will influence these conversations to become more dialogic as her work empowers the voices of the powerless. As a student, Rochelle consistently assesses what she needs to do to, to achieve her scholarly goals, and she sets herself to the task of learning what she needs to do. I've been repeatedly impressed with her drive and determination, her persistence, her continually increasing conceptual sophistication. Rochelle has performed reliably well, all while raising three young children, the third of whom, as I said, was born just as she was beginning our program. Amazing. I couldn't have done it. I was having my babies. She's not missed a step. Rather, each life challenge that she encounters as a woman, as a mother, as an American of African descent, fuels her scholarship with insight and enriches her scholarly vision in an embodiment of the self-reflexivity that is so crucial to excellence in critical scholarship. So Rochelle's drive, determination, vision, and, perse and perseverance and persistence stands to make a difference both in our discipline and in the field of healthcare, and her work empowers the marginalized and gives voice to the silenced and the muted. Her work is insightful, timely, and challenging. She's chosen to follow her conscience and her heart in pursuing a line of work that is neither easy nor well-trodden. She's a pioneer in her chosen line of research and she unfailingly meets the challenges that confront her as a scholar and a person. So I am very proud to present this word to Michelle Mhande. Hello, Michelle. Yeah. I don't think she's here though. Still gets it. Okay, it's my turn. So Andy, give me an award. I will give her a word. Uh, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. That's how things work in the Department of Communication. Um, all joking aside, it's uh, my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce Andy because I have come to know Andy in many different contacts over the last couple of years. She took classes from me. Um, she, uh, I'm on her dissertation committee. Um, you know, I serve as the PH director and she is a key student leader in our department. And also she works uh, as RA on a grant project that Xiaomei and I are leading. So I've had a lot of opportunities to get to know Andy and the more I know Andy, the more I enjoy knowing Andy and having her um, as a collaborator and as a student. Um, Andy is smart, she is dedicated, um, she is eager to make a difference, large or small. Um, you know, she has tremendous uh, interpersonal, organizational, and uh, leadership skills, and she is a delightful person, just fun to be around. Um, you know, so I think she is indeed an all around uh, outstanding PhD student. So much so that I have recommended her highly to uh, my colleagues at FDA who have decided to hire her as an OREIS fellow starting, I think, next month 
well, I don't know the exact starting dates, but they are very, very excited to have Andy join them. Um, and they know about this award too. So fair warning to Andy, they are scheming to put this award in their traditional hazing ritual that is getting ready for you. All right, congratulations, Andy, a very well deserved award. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm, I'm a little, little nervous about the hazing that is going to occur now, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. And it has been an honor to work under so many of you and with my fellow grad students. So thank you. I appreciate it. All right. That brings us to the end of our presentations of awards and recipients. And we have a brief moment while we, uh, Brittany gets a video tribute queued up for our MA students and our PhD students, and it was brought to my attention that JR did not get a chance to say something after he this received his, his award. Um, and I just wanted to ask JR, did you want to, did you have anything to say or want to say anything before we move on? Sure. Yeah, I, I can say something really quick. Um, so I, I didn't have something really prepped, so I was just going to keep this short and sweet, but I did want to say it was a, it is a great honor to receive this award and you know after after talking with Dr. Rowan and learning a little bit more about Bill um, I really found myself like humbled to receive it just because of what Bill did with his life and what he really did in the, the last moments of his life so um, uh, I'm incredibly thankful and honored to receive it so thank you again. Thanks Sarah. I'm sorry about that we were getting ourselves organized at the beginning there. Um, you all you all may or may not have noticed in the um, classroom slash conference room in the module in the back of the room is a big plaque with Bill's picture on it and a, and, and a little history about him and his bio. So once we're back on campus, you know, um, take a look um, in there if you want to learn more um, about Bill. And JR, if you like, if you like, I can uh, put you in touch with um, his parents and his wife. Um, if you wanted to shoot them a note, I think that would be nice to, to um, ordinarily they attend this, um, this ceremony. I don't know if they're, I don't think they're on camera. I don't think they were be able, be able to come to the, to the virtual ceremony. Yeah, no, I actually reached out to Dr. Rowan and uh, she's got me in contact with them. So I'm going to read them a letter and, and tell them thank you for, for everything they did and what their son did. So thanks. Yeah, I'm always behind Kathy Rowan. She's always two steps ahead of me. With that said, I think, Brittany, are we ready for the video tributes or you need a moment? I'm all good. Everyone just wants to make sure they're muted so that um, there's no feedback during it. There's no sound. Okay, Shaylin, can you mute yourself real quick? I think Shaylin's not muted. Brittany, there's no sound. Try it again this way. If it doesn't work, I will open my iMovie and we'll go from there. It's probably because I muted myself. That's why. Awardees, Lakeisha, master students, all awardees, congratulations. I'm so proud of you and so happy that I was able to work with some of you while I was at George Mason University. Please stay in touch and let us know if we can help you in the future. We'd be delighted to do so. Congratulations.
To all of our graduating master's students, I wish you all the best on the road ahead. Onward and upward. May students, thank you so much for spending this time with us here at George Mason University in the communication department. It has been an honor and a pleasure and a privilege working with each and every one of you. And please stay in touch as you move on to do amazing things at the next stages of your careers. Congratulations again. Congratulations, class of 2020. Even though this isn't how you plan to end your last semester or the way that we plan to celebrate with you today, please know that we are so proud of you for everything that you have accomplished, all of the ways that you have persevered, and all of the ways that you are going to go out and change the world. Hello, master's students, Professor Clark here, wishing you a happy graduation. Graduation for me is the most exciting day of the academic year, and I am very sad I won't be able to share it with you this year in person. However, that in no way diminishes how proud I am and how proud I think you should be at what you have accomplished here at Mason. I offer you my wholehearted congratulations and best wishes for the future. Congratulations, and the class of 2020. I wish you the best of luck. Hi, class of 2020. This is Sultan Kim, your professor in the Department of Communication. Today, I would like to send you my sincere congratulations on your eighth graduation. I know you have worked really hard because I had many of you in my comp six week. I know it's not the same as having face-to-face -face graduation ceremony, but I still do hope that um, you can still enjoy your big day with your family at home. It's a really big milestone, so congratulations again. I wish you peace, happiness, and a lifetime of good communication skills. You are Mason Com, and you will be Mason Com forever. Hello to the graduating class of 2020. I wish I could be saying this to you in person, but things are what they are. And with that being said, I know some of us are a little apprehensive about what the world's going through and what the future is for us individually and collectively. But I want you to rest assured that you have demonstrated already that you have a lot of resiliency in you that you have what it takes to complete a task all the way through despite whatever challenge may be. So keep that in mind and remember, good things are in store for you. And I wish again, I could be saying this to you in person. I miss seeing so many of you and having those conversations we've had in the past. Congratulations and all the best to the future for you. And on that note, we'll turn back over to Richard, who will read out all of our MA graduates from this year. All right, thank you, I'm back. And so I will slowly go through names. <clears throat> our MA graduates for the class of 2020 are Catherine Amin, Kiara Candelaria, Lindsay Christofferson, Sydney Cole, Kristen Dalton, Erin Harpine, Aaliyah Harrison, Rebecca Keating, Henry Lancaster, Sylvia Landis, Aruj Latif, Meredith Muckerman, Andrew Nation, Jennifer Novick, Lenore Pedicor, Jennifer Jenny from the Block Shaskin, Victoria Smith, Brianna Stewart, Dominique Stiletti, Marissa Strain, Christopher Sullivan, Victoria Swan, and Shannon Taylor. Congratulations, all you guys. If you want us to keep in touch with you at something other than a Mason email address, please make sure Brittany's got your email address so we can add you to our alumni list. Congratulations, everybody. You are now Masters of the Universe. We're going to move on to our PhD tribute video. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hi, Dr. Christy Forrester. This is Kathy Rowan, and I speak on behalf of your entire doctoral committee. It was such a pleasure working with you. We're so proud of your work on occupational health and safety. Good luck and all the best. Hi, this, uh, this message is about Jackie Post, and I am her advisor, Tim Gibson. Uh, Jackie's dissertation, defended uh, in December 2019, was titled Legal Lacuna, Sovereignty and Deference, a Radical Critique of Liberalism and the Chevron Doctrine. Jackie, your dissertation was original and insightful and compelling, and it really forever changed the way I think about the Supreme Court and how and the role it plays in our um, democracy or, or lack thereof um, in many cases. And I remember one thing in particular that during your proposal defense, I, I was kind of pushing you to potentially take a more optimistic take on the Chevron Doctrine and its application and, and to think about spaces or opportunities for using the Doctrine to pursue the common good. And uh, you listened, but ultimately you stuck to your guns. You know, you followed the data and your analysis to where it led, which, um, which was, you know, the conclusion of that the Supreme Court, and particularly as revealed in the Chevron Doctrine, was and is uh, essentially just another uh, avenue or venue for the arbitrary application of power toward ideological ends. Um, and I was so proud of you, how you stuck to your guns and stuck to your analysis and, um, and, and you know, followed the data where, and, the, and your analysis of the historical moment where it was leading you. And so, um, and if anything, six months after you defended, um, the last six months have shown that you were right. <laughs> so you are an amazing scholar, and I have been so blessed and so pleased and so proud to work with you over these past years. Congratulations, Dr. Pumps. Mr. Rolf Redding, it was a pleasure and an honor to be the chair of your dissertation titled Communicating Hope About Social Issues. Through both your research and your personal role model, you've taught me and countless other scholars and climate advocates the importance of keeping hope alive, especially when failure is not an option, as is the case with climate change. So I thank you and I congratulate you, Dr. Rolf Redding. Hello, I'm pleased to introduce our next graduating doctoral student, Deepay. He is a health communication researcher um, her work is mostly in intercultural contexts. Her dissertation is entitled Chinese Parents' Medical Decisions for Children. Why do they choose self-medication with antibiotics? This is a very important topic. Um, self-medication with antibiotics, particularly with children, is a very serious uh, problem in China, leading to many medical emergencies and even deaths every year. So I'm very glad that Dee has taken on this topic for her dissertation research. So it's a very, very uh, interesting study, a very important work, and Dee has demonstrated um, her important attributes uh, as a uprising health communication scholar. Uh, that is, she is smart, she is diligent, and she is humble as well. I think those qualities will carry her a long way in her future career. Congratulations, Dr. Pei. I'm very proud of you. This is Gary Krebs. I'm pleased to congratulate my doctoral advisee, Linda McGuire, on her outstanding dissertation and earning her doctoral degree this semester. Her title of her present effort dissertation is Cognitive, Functional, and Narrative Improvements After Individualized Singing Interventions in dementia patients. Uh, this was a very innovative and in-depth field experimental test of the use of guided strategic singing interventions with um, elderly uh, dementia patients, like, like people with Alzheimer's disease, um, who uh, had uh, significant cognitive and communication dysfunctions. Uh, she found that after implementing these uh, singing interventions, uh, we could find significant improvements in their ability to think clearly, uh, remember, uh, communicate effectively, and engage in other 
interactive behaviors. It was a very dramatic finding. I'm very hopeful that this groundbreaking research uh, will be um, expanded and developed into a variety of intervention programs to help people with dementia. Congratulations, Linda. I'm really proud of you. Greetings. My name is Mark Hobson, Associate Professor in the Department of Communication. Congratulations to the graduating class of 2020 at George Mason University. These are unprecedented times. On one hand, we're in the midst of a global pandemic, but on the other hand, it is a time for pomp and circumstance because I get to congratulate Ayo Dafridi Otusanye on the successful completion and defense of the dissertation titled, If You Hadn't Come to See Me, You Would Probably Be Dead exploring health communication and intercultural communication issues surrounding polycystic ovary syndrome. Surely this important work is the foundation for much more important work to come. I look forward to it, Ayo. And again, I'm proud to say congratulations to you, Dr. Ayo Dafferidi Otusanye. Congratulations. Congratulations. Congratulations, everyone. Okay. I will read out the names of the PhD graduates um, class of 2020. Christy Forrester, Linda McGuire, Ayu Altusanye, D. Pei, Jacqueline Popist, Justin Roth Redding. Congratulations. All right, with that being said, I think all of our congratulations are in, and as it says at the bottom of our information to all of our graduates and award winners, we are so proud of you and all you've accomplished. We wish you all the best in your future endeavors. I got to tell you, this is one of those moments in a time like this when you just find some joy. <laughs> um, I've enjoyed being online with all of you right now, and the support and the encouragement of the department just filters through online, even when we're not in person together. So. Um, with that being said, I think it's a good time to close the evening. I know everybody starts sending well wishes as soon as I, I'm finished talking and the microphones will flood open. So I want to let that happen and everybody just stay safe and be well and enjoy the summer ahead. Hopefully we have some time to relax and enjoy the, the weather and all. Congratulations, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, everyone. Congratulations, everyone. Hi, everybody. <laughs> for the support. Everyone. Thanks for putting this together, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.